Well, Happy New Year. It's my privilege to uh, preach from the main pulpit today on this first Sunday of 2024 as uh, Pastor Jeff is traveling. He's on the East Coast. He's uh, visiting his dad and mom. It's his dad's 80th birthday, so they're doing a family recognition of an important event. But I get to preach this morning, and I'm happy to do it. Uh, I'll be preaching from the Apostle Paul's epistle to the church in Rome. So if you'd like to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, we'll be looking closely at verses 1 and 2 of what is a pivotal chapter in Paul's lengthy letter. And I want to make the argument that these verses represent not just the perfect New Year's resolution, but that they represent the ultimate everyday resolution that all Christians everywhere should commit to by God's grace and in his strength. Well, let's read now verses 1 and 2, and I'll begin to show you what I mean. Beginning in verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let's pray for our time ahead. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I pray that our message time would be fruitful as we open up your perfect word. I pray this would be your message to those assembled, and by the power of your spirit, hearts would be open to receiving holy scripture. Lord, this message is lifted up to you as an act of love, obedience, and worship, and I pray that I would neither add to nor take anything away from your perfect truth. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, if you're like me, you've been thinking about starting the new year well. Perhaps you've committed to some New Year's resolutions like so many Americans do every January 1st. We certainly live in a culture that strongly promotes the idea of a New Year's reset. I've noticed this week that my phone is chasing after me. Advertisements aplenty, and uh, they're kind of relentlessly resolving me to lose some weight in 2024, so it's, how does it know? Um, you know, some gym membership, some fasting app, some revolutionary diet that nobody's ever thought of. <clears throat> My phone attempting to influence me in this way is kind of scary. When you think about it, um, technology that we have these days that we walk around with is gathering information on us, and then it's running it through algorithms so that they can target us as consumers, or in this evil age, some other dark things that are worse. I've said before, these phones that we carry around with us are a blessing, but they're actually quite dangerous. We need to have wise stewardship over them, and we probably need some real accountability, if we're honest with ourselves, to use them safely. But aside from the careful with your tech thought, resolving to improve ourselves is not in and of itself a bad thing. And the calendar rollover every January is... Uh, a quite reasonable incentive to think about such things. One contemporary writer, cultural writer, said it this way, the drive for making resolutions is motivated by this punctuation in time. It activates hope and expectations for what we want to achieve going forward. With a new year comes a sense of renewal. That makes us think about what we want to improve or change. And quite interesting, interestingly, the vast majority of resolutions that people make every January 1st, year on year, center on three things. Number one, the stewardship of our bodies. Number two, the things we choose to think about and believe in, which, might, which you might say is the stewardship of thinking. And finally, it's the control of our will, our choices we make, our human will. But it is one thing to desire to improve, even to commit to improve. It's another thing altogether to actually bring about lasting change in our personal habits. Change is hard. Putting off a bad habit and putting on a good habit is bluntly very, very difficult to do. My wife, uh, when we were talking about this, mentioned something about New Year's resolutions and she, <laughs> She said there's even something called Failure Friday, which is kind of like the second Friday of the month where 
everybody's resolutions blow up, right? <clears throat> but I want to argue that when we have a motivation that's rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ alone, we can make meaningful change. God can make meaningful change in us because in Christ, it's not all on us. We can change through the power of God. We can't access the power of God unless we're saved. So hold that thought because I want to open that up more as we go. But my guess is that now that we're one full week into the new year that some life has already happened to you, right? That's the way life is. And very likely if you had high hopes, maybe some of them are already dashed. I know that I'll admit to having had a difficult week. Um, we had a very dramatic and unexpected uh, turn of events with our, our beloved puppy dog, our golden retriever, Oliver, got sick and... Uh, Within about six days, we had to put him down, and I, I just didn't see that coming. And so we're hurting, and we miss him, and it's hard to even think about resolutions and improvements, but that's the way it is with life, right? We can't anticipate the things that uh, can surprise us and happen to us. This dog stole my heart, and I have been really profoundly sad. And it's interesting because I probably need to focus on this this uh, pericope in Scripture, this Romans 12, 1 and 2, perhaps more than any of you do this week. It's interesting sometimes when you get to preach, the passage that God br brings to mind is the one we need to hear most as the preacher. <laughs> so I am excited to have studied this. I'm excited to bring it to you. But when we live in a fallen world, things just do happen. We have surprises around every corner. And we're constantly reminded that we're weaker than we think, and we're constantly reminded that we are actually in control of absolutely nothing. Life happens and in ways that we don't expect. And in the unbelieving world out there, people lose hope. Their temporal resolutions falter. And I'm standing before you this morning saying that any hope resting in men, any hope resting in institutions of men, any hope resting in self apart from the power of God is going to be easily overcome in this world. Too many people start February 1st just like they may have left off in the previous November. They're mired in habits that deep down they know are poor or sinful or destructive, and they tend to fail in their resolution and feel like a failure, and, and they descend into hopelessness, and then somehow they look forward to the next January when they can do a reset. And I'm here to say the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is so elegantly captured in the five solas of the Reformation, which says that our salvation comes by faith alone, in Christ alone, through grace alone, according to the scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone. This gospel of Jesus Christ is the single antidote to the New Year's resolution conundrum and frankly to every other problem that you can face in this life, in this temporal life. So let's read our passage again. Let it sink in. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. What I want to show you is that these two verses written by the Apostle Paul over 2,000 years ago really can be viewed as the ultimate everyday resolution. That's the title of the sermon, if you look in your bulletin, and that this resolution is something that every Christian must undertake in order to grow in wisdom and spiritual maturity as only the gospel allows, only the gospel. And we can call it resolving every day Paul's way, resolving every day Paul's way. And I would also argue that such an everyday attitude of resolution is going to utterly obliterate any temporal, self-focused, self-reliant, worldly resolution, whether it's on New Year's Day or not, that you could make. So if you're taking notes, I'm going to show you this beautiful truth under four headings. Four headings. Number one, the basis for resolving Paul's way. Number two, the character of resolving Paul's way. Number three, the demands of resolving Paul's way. Paul's way, and number four, the effects of resolving every day Paul's way. So let's turn now to the outline, point one, the basis or the reason why we want to listen to Paul and resolve today and every day. 
Look at the first half of verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. There it is. The basis for resolving Paul's way is mercy. It's mercy. Specifically, Paul is talking about the mercy of God as spelled out in the first 11 chapters of his incredible epistle to the Romans. God's mercy to the terribly and tragically fallen human race through the provision of his Son. Ken Hughes put it this way, radically sinful man was radically lost. But God provided a radical righteousness through the radical person of his Son, which made a radical new life and view of history possible. Here, Kent Hughes is succinctly capturing Paul's airtight treatise on the soul state of every person ever born. And he lays it down in the first 11 chapters, and he says it's a binary reality. You're either one thing or the other. A person saving faith in Christ alone determines whether he is either saved by God or he is lost. His soul is either right with the one true God of all eternity who is revealed in Scripture, or his soul is warring against this God of the Bible. He is either at peace with God or he is separated from him. He is either counted righteous in God's sight or he is due holy wrath. He is either counted righteous and graced with eternal life and fellowship with God or he is headed like Satan and the demons to never-ending punishment. He is either considered a royal family member of the king or he's an enemy of the crown. And there's more ways the Bible talks about this either-or reality, but Make no mistake, the Bible is crystal clear. The eternal trajectory of every soul is one place or another. It's either heaven, which is not what we deserve as heirs of Adam, born into sin and sinning regularly as a function of our sin nature, or it's hell. It's it's eternity apart from the grace of the gospel. Our destination is the place that we do deserve, which is separation from God forever because of unreconciled sin. The gospel solves our unsolvable problem. Our unsolvable problem, humanly speaking, our biggest problem, the one that we cannot solve ourselves, the gospel, is the answer. And when we experience the mercy of undeserved salvation, we are called to fully commit to our Savior. It's an understanding, and then it's an all-in commitment. We resolve to love and serve Him and unceasingly with motivation flowing from what? A heart of gratitude. 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 When was the last time you really felt grateful for something or someone? Sometimes I look at my family members and I'm overwhelmed with gratitude. We should think of the gospel this way. We should think of the gospel every day this way. We're grateful. Again, from Kent Hughes, The greater our comprehension of what God has done for us, the greater our commitment should be. Practically applied, Christ's gift, meditated on, accepted, taken to heart, is a magnet drawing us to deepest commitment to Him. Immense vision will bring immense commitment. Sometimes we sing hymns. There's a great hymn writer by the name of Isaac Watts, and he wrote, Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul my life, my all. So Paul is not making a suggestion here. He's not asking a favor when he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. Rather, he's stating an obligation, an obligation. And we have to think about what Christ has done and make our commitment, make our resolution to him accordingly. Today, every day, all day. We commit. We're all in. There's scarcely nothing more important for building our commitment to live each day resolved than an increasing understanding of the greatness of God and His mercy to us. We serve a big God, and we serve an incredibly merciful God, and as we increase in our understanding, this has an ever-improving effect. We wake up to God more and more, and this transforms Maybe basic gratitude and low understanding into more understanding and deeper and unwavering love, and then down the road, further understanding, and then that should result in profound awe, awe, a great description for the one being in the universe that deserves to be counted awesome, 
we should be in awe of God. He deserves it. He alone is worthy. John MacArthur made this same point well in his commentary on Romans when he said, and I'm quoting, the key to spiritual victory and true happiness is not in trying to get all we can from God, but in giving all that we are and have to Him. Countless thousands of people today, including many genuine Christians, flock to various churches, seminars, and conferences in search of personal benefits, practical, emotional, and spiritual, that they hope to receive. They do just the opposite of what Paul so plainly emphasizes in Romans 12, 1 to 2. In this forceful and compassionate exhortation, the apostle does not focus on what more we need to receive from God, but on what we are to give him. The key to productive and satisfying Christian life is not in getting more, but in giving all. End quote. So the basis for committing to the ultimate everyday resolution to resolving every day Paul's way as expressed in Romans 12, 1 and 2 is gratitude. Gratitude that over time builds a deep and abiding and eternal love for the God who saved us. All right, well, let's look at the character of resolving Paul's way. Point number two of your outline it's given to us in the last, last half of verse one. Paul exhorts his readers to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. This is how we manifest our profound gratitude. We present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God in a worshipful way. Before we trusted Christ, we used our bodies for sinful pleasures and purposes. We believe that the body belongs to us, and now that we belong to Christ, we want to use his, our bodies for his glory. We should want that. The Christian's body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It says so. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. The Spirit of God dwells in us, as promised in Romans 8 9. That's the promise of the new covenant, God himself indwelling in the heart of the believer. And it's our privilege to glorify Christ in our bodies and magnify Christ in our bodies, as it says in Philippians 1, 20 to 21. Notice here that Paul's command has three prominent characteristics. It's total, it's ongoing, and it's rational. It's reasonable. The totality of the commitment, as one writer said, it comes dramatically to us through the language of sacrifice. Sacrifice, the Greek translated to present is a technical term used for ritual presentation of sacrifice. Your bodies signifies everything that we are, our totality. And then sacrifice refers to the idea in which the offering is totally consumed. Totally consumed. Old Testament sacrifices pervade the picture here. It's a total sacrifice. It's not a partial sacrifice. It's all of it. Then we see that unlike the Old Testament sacrificial system, this new covenant sacrifice is described as what? Living, holy, and acceptable. The believer isn't killed like in the Old Testament sacrifices, but remains alive. We're to be living sacrifices in the deepest theological sense of newness of life. We sacrifice, God gives us life. We give, and he brings life and change and transformation. As it says in Romans 6, 4, we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. We're to be holy in that we have renounced our sin and we're set apart for God. And finally, we're to be acceptable sacrifices, not because we deserve to be accepted, but because Christ in his sacrificial death and our faith in him, the faith that he gives us, we are counted righteous by his righteousness. And then we're to give ourselves as living sacrifices in true faith and humble submission and boundless gratitude. That's the picture. And this is the Spiritual worship that's for our good and his glory. This is a bold call to be totally and ongoingly committed to our faith. It means every day. It means multiple times a day. 
It's not just a New Year's commitment. Total and ongoing commitment rooted in total and ongoing gratitude. And every believer is expected to resolve every single day to present our bodies, living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Folks, this means that quite simply there's no room in your life for secrets. There's no room in your life for some hidden thing that isn't pleasing to God. There are no secrets before him. He knows everything. He is everywhere. He's all-powerful. And so, as you think about this in the new year, do business as God, with God. We're going to take communion shortly, and there are things maybe that we just need to get right. We just need to come clean on. Well, it's not only is commitment to be total and ongoing, it's also rational, it's also logical, it's, it's obvious, you might say. For Paul, true worship and offering ourselves to God is reasonable and logical because it is consistent with the proper understanding of the truth of God as re- revealed in Jesus Christ. Total commitment really is the only rational course to take when we really see who God is. Nothing else makes any sense. Considering our body is a living sacrifice, is isn't some, some weird, over-the-top, ritualistic, religious thing. No, it's, it's a completely and utterly rational thing to do because we see God for who he is. World War II-era British theologian Charles Cranfield said this, the intelligent understanding of worship, that is, the worship which is consonant with the truth of the gospel, is indeed nothing less than the offering of one's whole self in the course of one's concrete living, in one's inward thoughts, feelings, and aspirations, but also in one's words and deeds. Halfway or half-hearted commitment is simply irrational, so goes the argument. It doesn't make sense. This can't be a what's-in-it-for-me proposition where we're up and down with our feelings. It can't be some partial acceptance and faith in God that's up to a limit where we say, I don't know, I don't know if I can serve a God that would do you fill in the blank. Perceived injustices of his decrees and commands, we must never put God on trial. We have to decide to give our all, to decide to give a part of our life to God and keep other parts for ourselves, like saying everything is yours, Lord, but this relationship or this deal or this house or this whatever it may be, this pleasure I'm secretly partaking in, it defies spiritual logic. That's what Paul's telling us here. One commentator said it this way, if we are worshiping apart from commitment to God, it is false worship. We are deceiving ourselves if we are doing, quote unquote, Christian things, but not consecrated to Jesus Christ. This is why as we grow in the knowledge of his mercy, we should be more committed at age 21 than 16 more so at 35, 45, 60, and 70, end quote. We need to be growing, we need to be committing so that we can grow. Well, having seen the basis and character of resolving everyday Paul's way in verse one, let's look at the demands of resolving Paul's way, which is found in the first part of verse two. You might say we've covered the what of the matter and now we're gonna look deeper into the how. How do we do this? Look at the first half of verse two. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. There are two clear commands here. The first is negative, stop doing something. Stop being conformed to this world. And the second is positive, start doing something. Start being transformed by the renewal of your thinking. Let's look at the negative command. What does this mean? Do not be conformed to this world. Well, conformed comes from the root word schema, from which we derive scheme. And the world can be translated as age, referring to the passing age. 1 Corinthians 7.31 refers to the things of this world that are not of God and are therefore not permanent. For this world in its present form is passing away. In Paul's salutation opening Galatians, he says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from what? 
the present evil age, according to the will and of our God and Father. This is Galatians 1.4. And then 1 John 2.17 says, the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Folks, the, the world around us, the present age, the modern culture, pop culture, politics, the media, even sports. I'm a sports fan. I like football. I like to limit my TV to sports and then turn commercials off. That's where we've gotten to. But we should understand the Bible says that all of these areas of our world in the main are dominated by Satan. That's a strong statement, easily pulled out of context. We, we can't reject the world. We have to live in the world. But we also have to understand what the Bible says and let that truth sink in. This is an evil age that we live in. And so Paul's words can be paraphrased, don't be conformed to the schemes of this passing evil age. We have a uh, lovely and vitally important Christian school here at Grace, and it's not hard to see that the single greatest social pressure that our young students face is conformity. Kids sometimes lacking guile and sophistication tend to demonstrate the pressure of conforming and the pain of non-conforming in raw ways, they show an unfiltered, unfiltered humanity if we care to look. Results can be heartbreaking. And now we have social media that just amps everything all the more. So the pressure is immense. It's immense. We have a bullying crisis in America, the experts tell us. But it's not just confined to young people. We adults are really no different, if we're honest. We're just a bit more subtle about bringing and feeling conformity pressure. R.C. Sproul said it this way, what saps the strength of Christian witness in our day is the Christian community's conformity to the world. We do not want to be seen as foolish any more than a teenager does. Yet that is exactly what we are called to be, fools for Christ. The things we cherish and follow are the things the world considers foolish and rubbish. Paul says a Christian is to be a nonconformist. Well, the painful truth is such conformity to the world to the present evil age is a lot more common than we care to admit. It's very easy. It's a slippery slope. It's insidious. We start to slide a little bit, and then we wake up, and we go, how do we, how do we get here? We have to be aware. We have to be thinking about committing daily and sometimes it's hard to know when we're conforming in a manner that's counter to God's will for us because there's so many good things in the world. But when we're making the good things of the world some, some way more important than our relationship with God, we're starting to head down a, a troubling path. And we, we have to live in the culture. We can't write off the culture. We have to be a part of it, but we also have to think critically. We have to, on an everyday basis, think biblically. This word, this word is inerrant, it's sufficient, it's authoritative, and it has to be our manual for all life and doctrine, period, full stop. So except for the Bible, we have to be careful what we read and watch every day, especially going into this year, 2024, which I think promises to be a wild ride. And... We need to buckle up. We need to buckle up with the power of the word. And we need to buckle up together in the church. We need each other, desperately. We need to be the church. We need to do the one another's and hold each other accountable in the church. Because nobody's got it perfect. We're all sinning. But getting right with God on a daily basis is what Paul's exhorting us to do here. We're going to find refuge and reinforcement in the church together. Well, let's look at the positive command. What does it say? It says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Again, the language here is graphic. Transform sounds like metamorphosed, which in the original Greek is the word from which we get metamorphosis. The idea of change from one form to another, as in the transformation of a tadpole to a frog or from a caterpillar to a butterfly or nature's examples. In Alaska, we have extreme transformations do we not? I mean, go to Fairbanks in the middle of July and then go tomorrow. Pretty drastic difference, right? 
We see it all around us, but when we think of the gospel, we have to think in terms of rescue and transformation, in terms of being saved by someone or something outside of ourselves from a terrible state, a terrible future. We're on a trajectory that's not good. We have to think of being pulled from the edge of the cliff type imagery. We're being saved, we're being pulled back, and then we're lovingly being made from one thing into something completely different, completely better. Transformation has been hijacked by the culture, by the politicians, by the progressives. That word is being used all over the place to put pressure on moral standards and traditional things. We don't want to get confused with that. We have to go back to what Paul is telling us in the gospel. In Romans, he's saying salvation in the gospel is the most dramatic and significant transformation of all. It is the single Greatest possibility for human beings because it transforms us from being an enemy of God to becoming a beloved, adopted child of God, accepted in God's royal family by God's grace and power, by means outside of ourselves. We don't do this. God in his sovereignty and providence saves us to his glory. So we're moved from one side of the binary equation described earlier to the other, and God does it. We move from lost to found, and this is why Paul, formerly Saul, writes boldly in verse 16 of chapter 1, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Paul's not ashamed of the gospel because he was an incredible beneficiary of the gospel, perhaps the most noteworthy beneficiary of all time. His transformation was so shocking, so dramatic, so extraordinary, so improbable, so extensive, so extreme, so miraculous that he really is portrayed in the New Testament as the very model of gospel rescue and amazing transformation, going from Saul to Paul. Paul was in every aspect and every respect an enemy of God. He was the epitome of someone deserving holy wrath because he was a Pharisee of Pharisees and He was out there professionally and underwritten by the Jewish church, persecuting and killing Christians, those who God had saved and who were counted righteous by their faith. Well, what happened to Paul? Well, we know that uh, it's an amazing story. His conversion is instructive to us, right? God did something. God initiated a gracious intervention. The resurrected Christ, the second member of the Trinity, appeared to Paul as he was headed to Damascus, right? On his search and destroy mission, God intervened. And through the dramatic encounter with Christ, Paul was changed forever. He was rescued, and then for the rest of his life, he's in a process of transformation from being one thing to something entirely different. Paul, by God's power and his perfect providence, was saved. He experienced salvation. He wasn't looking for it, believe me, but he was rescued through Christ's finished work. And the one and only thing that Paul did in that moment of salvation was believe. He believed. He received and acted upon the faith that was given to him in the first place. And then we know that God went on to use Paul mightily. This rescued man served the Lord with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength until his dying breath. It's a beautiful picture. It's an instructive picture for us. And Paul's, frankly, his transformed life was not marked by worldly things, health and wealth and fame. Far from it. No, his temporal life after conversion was quite the opposite of his Pharisee days when, you know, he was um, somebody, so to say, in the church. He had authority. He had position. He had wealth. He could speak with authority, but afterwards, he's a Christian, and now he's one of those, and his life is one of struggle and scorn and persecution, prison, prison, and even shipwreck. So we need to think about Paul, and it's awesome that he wrote Romans. It's awesome that he wrote all the epistles that he did. The full meaning of being transformed, though, is even richer, and I want to show you this. Um, There are three other uses of the word metamorphose in the New Testament. In Matthew 17, 2, and Mark 9, 2, it's describing the transfiguration of Christ. The same language is used 
when Christ is being transfigured, when he is um, before his three beloved disciples uh, on that moment on the Mount of Transfiguration, he is revealing his glory to kind of prepare these guys as he gets ready to set his face at, towards Jerusalem and there to follow him and go in and be strengthened by what they saw. That's an awesome, awesome uh, coverage in the Synoptic Gospels. But we experience a unique and eternal transfiguration in Christ. He sanctifies us and promises to glorify us. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, using the very same word, and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We have to look at how this happens. Again, the language is expressive. Uh, our text says, be transformed. It's a passive imperative command. And this must be meaning that it must be done by someone or something else outside of us, which is who? It's the Holy Spirit. It's the third member of the, the Trinity. We're to submit on a daily basis and an ongoing basis to the Holy Spirit who brings about this renewal of our mind. And we also have to see that it's, it's just a gradual, present tense process. It's ongoing, and it happens over a lifetime. That's the picture of sanctification. We have the different terms of salvation. Justification is our, is our new legal status before God. We're now legally... When God looks at us, he sees Christ's righteousness, and all of our sins are transferred to the penalty that Christ paid for us. And then our salvation is sure, we can't lose it, we're justified, we're sealed by the Spirit, we're indwelled with the Spirit, and then the rest of our lives, the Holy Spirit is making us daily more like Christ. But we have to lean into that and say, yes, yes, every day, ongoing way. Ultimately, Romans 8, 29 says we're going to be supremely transformed, the, the ultimate metamorphosis, which is into the image of Christ in eternity, and we're to answer to call every day resolving Paul's way so that we can benefit from the beauty of the gospel, justified, sanctified, glorified. One writer said it this way, Voice a monumental no to the schemes of this fleeting evil age and a determined yes to the transforming work of the Holy Spirit and renewing your minds. The no without the yes will lead to a life of futile negation. The yes without the no will lead to frustration because Christ will not dwell in Satan's house. These are not suggestions, but are rather imperial commands to be obeyed by all. Strong language, but that's, that's our scripture. Let's turn now to uh, our last point, our fourth, fourth heading, which is the last aspect of resolving Paul's way, where we can see the effects of every day resolving Paul's way. What, what happens when we do obey here? Well, let's look at it. Paul says that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We can have a beautiful fellowship with God. We can have communion with Him through the power of the Spirit. We can pray to Him because we're believers. We have access to power. We have access to the throne of God. It's an amazing reality in the gospel. And so a, graceful, a grateful heart motivated to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice in a manner where we're rejecting the world and determining to allow Him to transform us into His image leads us to a place where we can align our will with his perfect will. We can discern the will of God. How often do you hear Christians say, what is the will? What is the will of God for me? What, who should I marry? Who, where should I go to school? What profession should I decide on? Well, I think the first matter is being right with God and being in communion with God. And then guess what? Our will starts to align with his will. We see that. We see that. The longer you walk, the more you see that. We can discern God's will when we're right with him. The New English Bible perhaps says it best, then you will be able to discern the will of God and to know what is good 
acceptable and perfect. A committed life has the power to perceive what God's will is. The longer we walk with Christ, the more we see that God's will, whatever that may be, is the safest possible place for us. As a career military guy and someone who's been far away and in harm's way at times, well-intentioned people often thank me for my service, which I do appreciate, but I've, I've come to say when people do that where I can that my service was a great blessing and a privilege because I do believe that God called me to that. And I do believe that when I was called to go to faraway places, it was his will for me to do that. And there's a, there's a tremendous sense of understanding and comprehension and appreciation when we do that. What I discovered, I, I wasn't a Christian until 10 years into my military career, but what I discovered when I became a Christian and I started to understand the things of God and the truth of his word and the idea of following the, the promptings of the Spirit, rogering up to do hard things became different. I was less fearful. I won't say I didn't have fear, but these things became meaningful and comprehensible to me and it made sense. And I learned that I was saying yes to my ultimate commander who's the God of the universe. There simply is no safer, better, or more beneficial place to be than in the center of God's will. And Paul is telling us here that God's will is ever more clearly discerned when we resolved every day to, res to think Paul's way. So how do we do this? Well, it's in prayer. Prayer is a gift from God, right? It's, a, it's an amazing gift. And I would argue that unbelievers' prayers aren't heard. That's what Scripture will tell us if we're going to dig deep enough. Communion with God is possible because we move from one side of the binary equation to the other by faith. And in faith, we have to be indwelled with the Holy Spirit, and then prayer becomes really possible. So hear that. But we do have the gift of prayer, and the believer's prayer life can be amazing as we surrender our wills to God through a disciplined prayer life, and we surrender our will to God and pray with the Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. We pray that we follow his lead no matter where that leads us. And sometimes it's through really hard things. Sometimes it's through suffering. Sometimes it's through a combat zone. Sometimes it's through who knows what. But James 1 tells us that there's a refining that goes on when we suffer. We need to say yes to God. We need to trust him and not put him on trial. That's what Paul's telling us today. And then we can lean into the church to share in the one another's and to lift each other up and to gain perspective and to think this through together. We were born in this point in time in history because God appointed us to it and then he saved us in it and so we can't be fearful. We can't be thinking, oh, I'm afraid of next year so maybe I won't do this or I won't do that. No, we have to, I think if we get this everyday resolution right, we're gonna be bold and we're gonna be courageous and we're gonna step forward in faith and we're going to be able to discern God's will. One writer named Alexander McLaren expressed it like this, to know beyond what I ought to do and knowing to do it seems to me to be heaven on earth. And the man that has it needs but little more. One other writer said it this way, the one who is committed to God sees life with a sure eye while the careless and uncommitted are in confusion. He knows God's will, and he finds God's will to be good and acceptable and perfect. Well, let me just summarize our points. I made the point, argument that Romans 12, 1 and 2 can be viewed as the ultimate everyday resolution. And then we saw that the basis of resolving daily Paul's way is gratitude grounded in the mercies of God and his love for us. And we saw that the character of resolving daily God's way is presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And we saw that the demands come in two commands, one negative, do not be conformed to this world, and then a positive, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. 
And then I would argue that points one, two, and three sort of have a domino effect where we're doing this, we're doing it daily, and the result is we can truly discern God's will for our lives. And as we do so, we can see over and over and over and over again that His will is good and acceptable and perfect. 